Evening, everybody. Um, a few familiar faces around the room. Uh, first of all, quick apology. Much of what some of you sort of guys have been around today are going to hear now is going to recap some of the stuff that we talked about. But those guys who weren't around today in the training, hopefully some of it's going to be quite beneficial. Um, so essentially, what, what are we talking about? Well, before I talk, before I go into the presentation, just a little bit about Alcometer. Now, been dealing through the um, Duke Brothers at BAMR for, goodness, how many years, Graham? Um, 67 years or something, quite a long time. Uh, I think they're account number five on our all-time database. And when you sort of think that this, this, this I don't, goodness knows how many thousands now, it just shows there is a bit of longevity between the businesses. And therefore our presence in Southern Africa, which is quite nice to have and it's also really nice to be here. Um, so what are Alcometer? Well, well, we're essentially the, I suppose, probably the world's biggest um, coating inspection um, company, or supplier of coating inspection instrumentation. And we do that through a series of ways. Um, obviously, we have good sales teams. Um, that's clearly a good part of it. But I think another key part is the focus on product development. Now, we employ about um, 250 people worldwide. And there are in total just under 30 of them employed in the R&D centre in Manchester in England. And keeping 30 guys busy with new product development is a bit of a balancing act because they always want to go away in the geeky direction. And there's more commercial guys trying to bring them back and trying to put product into the market that we can sort of, um, the market can benefit from. So we're continually fighting that. And the subject of tonight's conversation was one of those real balance arguments as to how far do we take the techie side and, how, and balance it against some of the requirements of the marketplace. But let's talk about it in some detail then. So the overall talk is, you can see on the screen, we're talking, we're focusing on dry film thickness measurement and the latest, ad, latest techniques or the advances in the techniques of that. But to get, them, get to most from that, we really need to expand the conversation beyond just that, um, beyond just that area. So we're going to break it down into three key sectors. Each of them probably takes sort of 10 minutes or so to go through. Uh, you can see what they are, the, the trends for the market, which I think is really important because we have to pick up on what the market's telling us in addition to us having to try and have some influence on where the market's going. So those two things very much work together in our business. The, the second area is an example of this development of these sort of 30 guys that spend their lives trying to come up with something new. And in the field of um, coating thickness measurement, dry film thickness measurement, let's be honest, there hasn't been any massive changes in the technology for quite a number of years. There's been lots of refinements and improvements and speed increases and that kind of thing, but no really big significant change. And the introduction of the idea of, um, you can see the words there, the scanning function for a dry film gauge probe is we feel relatively revolutionary and gives the market a significant benefit that it didn't have before. And then we'll talk about the future, and that's a great two words. It could mean almost anything. But in our way of looking at it, what we're trying to think about is what, it, what happens with inspection. Where's the inspection market going? And what I want to introduce to you there is our thoughts on that and how we can get the benefit from um, some of the technology advances that present, the, the present digital age gives us. And so those are the three areas of, of the discussion. The first one, let's look at the trends. Now, I'm not going to read the slide, guys. I mean, you're all perfectly capable, capable of reading this. But the, what I'm really saying is that the market is demanding greater and greater and greater levels of inspection, greater levels of recording of data, greater detail. Basically, what they're asking for is more time spent on inspection but they want to pay us less money to do it. Now I know there's lots of industries that are faced with that conundrum, but it's something that's very hard to balance when you're already, you like to think, relatively efficient. And if the market direction is to try and push us to become even more efficient, yet throw barriers in our way of wanting to have greater and greater and greater complexity of information, the two things don't really equate. And so, you know, we, a few years ago, instead of looking at all those different five or six different characteristics we might want to measure, there might have been only one or two of them that people were interested in. So by way of you know, um, really il illustrating my point, 
so there's more and more, point, more and more areas of inspection required, it does make the issue more difficult to try and achieve in a timely, in a timely manner. Okay, so we said we need to inspect on all stages of the process. Um, that's a repetition in words, but it effectively saying that it requires increased amounts of inspection. But the key then is to provide some evidence that the work's being done. And I think some of you guys that have maybe been around um, an equivalent amount of time as myself uh, might have a slightly cynical view on this. Because there are people out there in the inspection world, and I'm sure none of them exist in South Africa, and certainly none of them would exist in the coating inspection area, but some people might just want to cheat. I mean, rather than go out into that dockyard and take lots of measurements, they've got a nice warm office, and they've got a gauge, and they can take several readings, and they can upload that, that, those readings into their report and sort of fudge it a little bit. But we can use the, the modern world to try and overcome that. And then just to highlight from that particular area, the way that we would try and overcome that is to say, if we can tag the data that you're recording, with where you were in the world when you recorded it, using that GPS technology, and we all carry these things around now, or most of us do, and they've all got GPS built into them, so why not use the technology to our help, to our advancement, and provide some level of evidence with GPS tagging that we were where we said we were, and we did what we said we did. And so that's really evidence that people are looking for. And the final evidence is that they want this data in the form of some kind of electronic report. Nobody's interested in wafting through a great load of paper anymore. They want to be able to use that data as part of a greater inspection criteria and store it electronically. So the world has really moved on. So what, do, what, what kind of equipment do we need? Well, we need equipment that we can throw around. It's rugged, it's, um, it's reliable, it's strong. More importantly, it's got to be um, able to be calibrated and certified. Without that, the whole quality control industry, or the ethos of it, is drawn into question. You also need to, as we said a couple of seconds ago, you might want to date and time, time stamp it or location stamp it, and we need to record it within the gauges. And we need to have some level of traceability about what that gauge did, how we calibrated it, how we set the gauge up, and all those characteristics. So basically, we require a lot more information than we did before. And hopefully you'll see from a couple of examples here of the different processes that we have um, gauges that can suit this application. Just working through the different areas. There's a bit of repetition here, but more of the, the point is made. There are now digital gauges that can do all of these inspection criteria. So, what do we do with it? What do we do with this? Well, essentially, there's all that myriad of data that we need to do something with. And those of you who have heard this talk before, those of you who are in the, the meetings today, will, excuse me, you've probably heard this story, but I'm going to repeat it anyway. Um, stop laughing. Uh, the story I'm going to say is that we were approached by a company called SGS, world's biggest inspection organization, and they basically said, we've got some problems because a week in the life of a coating inspector, less than two days of that, is he actually in the field? Now, this isn't always the case. This is an average. But less than 40% of his time, nearer 30% of his time, is he actually in the field? A day and a half to two days a week. And let's be honest, a coating inspector is a coating inspector because he likes inspecting coatings. He doesn't like sitting in an office typing reports because that's fairly dull in his mind. And what the SGS guy said is that at the moment, we're spending a day and a half to two days a week in the office, sorry, in the field, and the other three to three and a half days in the office manipulating data, creating a report, and sending it to our customer with our invoice. In other words, we get paid after we issue the report. Now, they said to us, we need help because we're not efficient. So what our reaction was, let's try and use the digital age. Let's try and create a piece of software that takes the data from all of, their all of those gauges that I highlighted and allows us to manipulate that data in the format in which our customers, our ultimate customer, wants to see it. And that's the key. Now, if we come up with a piece of software that gave a standard format, it's not of much use to the marketplace because each and every one of your customers will have a different format in which they want the data. 
And so as a consequence, any package we came up with had to be tailorable to create bespoke looking reports, creating, um, giving the information that that actual customer needed to see. And that information may well be very different to the next customer. So any kind of solution that we came up with to aid this three and a half days in the office needed to reflect that. And so what have we done? We've created a product called Elko Master Software. And this is the point whenever we talk about software that everyone goes to sleep because software is always something that at 6.30 in the evening, after a hard day at work, your immediate reaction is to say, oh, God, Craig, come on. But the little example I'll give you, um, I got a new computer a couple of years ago, had the latest version of Excel on it, and I looked at it and I couldn't use it because it was different. And I'm onto the old one back because I was fighting this idea of development and technology running forward. So I thought, come on, Craig, you, know, you're, you spend some of your life talking to people about why they should use our software. So think about it. So spend a couple, two hours, it cost me, two whole hours to learn how to use that software. And the benefit I've taken from it has been significant. Now, I'm not talking about changing my time from one and a half days, from five days to one and a half days. That's a bit extreme. But nevertheless, I got a benefit from learning the new software in a simple package like Excel. So using that example, what I'd like to think is that if you give me the time to explain it, you may, might be able to see that there is some benefit for you to do a similar thing in terms of learning our software as well. It's got all kinds of capability. We talk about the mobile platform with the free app to download that allows us to, to use the software and, and with the phone in your pocket. And it gives a one standard platform for all of those different gauges. More of that later. OK, let's just take a step back. And let's talk a little bit now. We've talked about the market, where it's going, and that, that kind of thing. But the focus has been a little bit on gauges, but mainly on the software development. But in addition, this idea that we're going to use all these engineers in our business to come up with new product, one of the key things they came up with is the ability to have a scanning function dry film thickness gauge probe. And before we kind of think about that, I mean, things have changed. Those of you who are old enough, um, might remember going back up to the, this gauge, back from the sort of early 90s, and going back up the tree, even older. Graham, I think your dad would know a lot about some of that stuff. But, uh, it, you know, it, it does, there is some history there. <laughs> I was being polite. I was being polite, Jane. <laughs> um, but, you know, culminating in where we are now with all kinds of wireless comms and software support, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but what does a dry film gauge do? Well, it simply allows us to measure the thickness of a cured coating and effectively compare it with the requirement. And the requirement we can build into the gauge, the reading we can build into the gauge, and the gauge can tell us if it's good or bad. That's essentially what it does. Now, of course, the latest gauges make that process easier, but, and we can then look and we can compare the values with the coating spec. We can define as and when we're in or out of specification. We can display details on the screen of the gauge that shows us where we are at that particular time in terms of, against the specification. And I'll show you this in a few seconds time on the actual gauge. Um, we can record date and time and blah, blah. How does it do it? On, on ferrous materials, ferrous substrates, it uses electromagnetic induction. Non-ferrous non metal substrates, it uses eddy current or the change in eddy current, eddy current diffraction. So in other words, if you think about the steel application, those of you who want to think back to our school days, if we had a piece of steel and a magnet, we put the magnet somewhere near the steel and you would feel the magnetic field, the attraction. The, steel, the magnet is being drawn towards the steel. And the thicker the steel, the more the magnetic force, typically. And essentially, this is exactly what we're doing here. We're generating an electromagnetic version of that magnetic field. And the more the field is at its maximum, when the magnet, or the probe, is on the uncoated surface. So you tell the gauge that, you educate the gauge to that, and it knows where no coating is. Then if you put a coating on it, so in other words, the probe is going onto the surface, it's not on the bare metal anymore, it's on the paint. It's therefore a distance away from the coating. The amount of field generated is different to when it's on no coating. And what the, all the gauge does is measure that change in field 
and come up with a distance, a thickness value for the coating. Now I say all, it's a little bit more complicated than that, than that as you can probably appreciate, but to all intents that's what it's doing, it's replicating a magnet in your hand on a piece of steel. Okay, that's what the gauge looks like. Key for, the key for that slide is this bit here. It's pretty damn quick. Click, 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 click. It's moving that quickly. We're taking a lot of readings. But, um, and then over history, that speed, that speed has increased. But if we then think about it, what's actually holding us back? And we were talking about this today. Is that what's holding us back is the physical movement capability of the individual who try and tries to take the readings. So to try and put that into some level of context, Dan, Rob, can we take out a coated panel, please? Um, what we would normally do with one of these gauges is put the probe down on the surface, lift it, move it, lift it, move it, lift it, move it, and the gauge reacts very quickly, but we still have to physically move it along. And that becomes quite a laborious and tedious process if it's your job to take several thousand of these per day. You soon get worn out. One of the jokes that we say is that you end up looking a bit like Rafa Nadal because he's got one big arm from playing tennis and the inspector's going to have one big arm from continually playing with his thickness gauge. But the limitation is therefore the speed at which you move it. So our concept was, could we do something to try and remove that limitation? In other words, could we make it such that the probe was co continually in contact with the surface, releasing the technology to do its best. Now the technology in the placing method is limited to about 70 readings a minute, but the technology in a scanning type method is really virtually unlimited. And the only limitation we've got for it is how much data do we need? Now with the previous method, we're looking at 70 readings a minute, and we decided that we would probably max this at 150 readings a minute. In other words, two and a half readings per second. Thanks, Dan. And to give you that as some kind of illustrative approach, the scanning function gives us a couple of capabilities. It releases that constraint and allows us to take a significantly f more frequent measurement. It's and say up to two and a half readings per second. We've then got the capability to do, to sort of start thinking about how we absorb that data, what do we do with it. And a couple of examples I will show you in a minute is how that, how that information is presented to us and what the alternatives we have for it. And then there's two different methods I want to show you. And then when we've looked at that, I want to give you an, um, a very quick run through of how we, what we then do with that data in terms of uploading it into our reporting format. In other words, how best to use our software. So what we've got there is, as I was trying to illustrate before, is basically that gauge on the big screen. And I'm going to put this gauge into um, the scanning mode. And if I go into the scanning mode, we've got the standard mode, which is the typical old fashioned way of doing things. We've got the auto repeat function and we've got the scan function. What I'm going to show you is just because it comes in that order is the auto repeat mode. And what the scan probe actually is, it's a regular probe with a protective cap and a bit of other tweaking. And that protective cap allows the probe to be in contact with the surface without damaging the delicate part of the probe, the expensive part of the probe, which is underneath the cap. In the past, using the regular probe, what we can't do is move it side to side because that lateral shear movement effectively wears away the probe surface very quickly indeed, particularly on a rough coating. So if we put a protective cap on it, which has got some defined wear characteristics which we can accommodate within the calibration of the probe, we can overcome that. And it continually warns us about making sure that we have the cap fitted. So what we're going to do is just run a, open up a batch and start recording some data. Now, it's slightly compromised by the fact that this software that Dan so kindly installed for me slightly slows it down. But essentially, you can see how quickly it's, it's amortizing data. And if we then change the display to show a run chart, what we can also see is on that screen the maximum, minimum, and average of the last 20 readings that we've taken. So quite a powerful um, tool to be able to see 
how we're, what, what measurements we're taking, how quickly we're taking them, and where there are any areas of concern. What we're seeing there is an indication of how quickly it's recording data. That's all well and good. We can put that data into what we call a batch and we can upload it to our computer as we will do in a few seconds. The other um, method, which is an interesting one because a story I'll tell you very quickly. I was in a place called um, Gujarat in northern India a few months ago when we released this product. I at a, a pipe coating company called Wellsman Pipes, a pretty big organisation. And the QC manager there said to me, I'm sorry Mr Craig, because they always call me Mr Craig. He said, I can't accept you're coming in here and telling me anything about dry fill measurement that I don't already know. So I've been in this industry for lots and lots of time and I really think I'm pretty astute, I'm pretty on it. And fortunately, outside his office, there's a 15 metre length of pipe. So we got this gauge and probe, put the probe on at one end, walked along the pipe, lifted it off and said, your maximum thickness was X, your minimum thickness was Y, and your average was Z. And he said, Mr. Craig, he said, come into my office. I think we have something to discuss. And that was really quite powerful because he essentially said, a result of what I'm just about to show you, if I run that probe over that surface, and can you, you've got to imagine that rather than run, running around a small piece of plate, we're on a big pipe. I then lift it off and I've got on there, on that screen, some quite powerful information. The maximum thickness, the minimum thickness, the average thickness, displayed as, on the graph here, the outliers and the average showing the spread of the data. If I then take another reading, which I'm going to cheat by holding it in the same place and just moving it a little bit, I then show you the second scan which shows a much more in control condition because the spread is significantly less. And that data presented on the screen of the gauge in front of the operator is staggeringly powerful. It gives us the capability to be able to see at a glance how in control our process is. So what that's showing us is that range and capability of the product to show repeatable results. Um, so those are the two different options we've got to be able to to really show the data that we're looking at. So what do we do with it? Let's move the, um, move the conversation on a little bit and move it into the actual software. The software, as you install it, will look vaguely like that. What Dan's got here is several gauges connected, or in his library of gauges, connected to his computer. Now what I'm showing you, I'm not gonna go sh show you through the connection of the gauge because all we do is press connect gauge and follow the instructions. What I'm going to show you is what happens when we've got that data. And we've got a whole series of information in there from different batches, from different gauges. You'll notice these little symbols here show what we call a dry film batch. That's that symbol is intended to show multiple coating levels. This one here is intended to show a surface profile measurement. And these ones are intended to show climatic condition measurements. And all the other products within our range have their own little icons as well. But what I want to show you in terms of how this software can work is one little example and then we'll, we'll have a little chat about it and have some questions. Now what we've got here, I don't know how well you can see that, but that is a, re a report based upon what the SSPC require when they measure dry film thickness. So there's lots of information on the top of the report that is optional data that we need to input and then in the areas such as around here, it's wanting the individual dry film gauge readings and it's then designed, the report format is designed to then calculate average, sorry, averages and uh, mins and maximums and all that kind of thing. So basically done some mathematics on the data. So we set that template up and that template is a standard document within the American organization SSPC. And effectively it is the, the dry film report that the SSPC use. Now that document could be anything. It could be, imagine, your document set up in your way. So how do we operate it? How do we complete it? Well, the way this one's set up is that there are six different batches, you can see here, six different batches of information it wants, six different batches of data that it wants me to put into the report. So if I just take a dry film batch here, a drag and drop it, and you will see immediately 
that that report is completed with the relevant data. So you can see, just by dragging and dropping the data from a batch, it's populated the report in the area where we want it. Now all I would need to do now to complete that report is drag and drop a further five pieces of data from different batches, save that report, and send it to my customer. And the way I would do that is either by clicking that button here to generate a PDF of the document, or to click that button there which would wrap it into a PDF and in, and into an email, and I would simply address the email to my customer. So all of a sudden we've gone from having to spend goodness, goodness knows how long in the office manipulating that data, or initially spending a day and a half, two days in the, in the, in the dockyard or wherever it happens to be, gathering the data, and then spending two, three days in the office manipulating that data. We've now done two things with the latest technology. We've allowed ourselves to gather that data much more quickly and much more readily by significantly enhanced speed. Not only speed, but we're also giving ourselves the opportunity to be able to assess how we're performing against our requirements on the screen of the gauge. And then we're uploading that data to the software, dropping it into a reporting format, and then immediately emailing it or sending it to our customer. All of that stuff is done, you've just seen, even when the software is connected and my computer worked, but all of that stuff is done literally in seconds. So we've gone from a role of taking data like this in a very laborious and tedious fashion, storing it into the computer, into the gauge, uploading it, doing something with it, trying to create our reports, taking us all that time into condensing it into a very short amount of time, literally only a few minutes of work. And that really is the illustration of what I'm trying to say. We use a digital technology to be able to move forward and we harness what's available to us to allow us to do that. And our business has really taken that opportunity, we feel, and listened to, listening to what you guys want us to do and come up with those kind of solutions. So really, that wraps up what I wanted to talk about. And thank you for listening. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you.